Well, hello, this is Tanner Dykin, pastor of Open Door Baptist Church, and uh, I just wanted to do a uh, short video here on the doctrine of the preservation of Scripture. Uh, I wanted to do this uh, now since the uh, Text and Canon Conference is coming up at the end of the week here, uh, and I wanted to, uh, uh, as a sort of a personal celebration of uh, this, uh, I wanted to put out uh, a small video on uh, the biblical uh, doctrine of preservation. Uh, and so uh, without uh, any further ado, we'll just uh, begin to go through uh, a few uh, passages of scripture uh, point by point. And I have these sorted out into the various categories. And so the first category are simply just direct statements of the preservation of scripture. Uh, we have two passages here, both from Matthew, uh, Matthew 5, 17 through 18. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. In Matthew twenty four thirty five, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Christ here states that the law will be preserved until the end of the world and beyond. He even states that the very distinction between letters and thus words will be preserved. He says that they will in no wise pass, meaning that there is no way his prophecy about Scripture can be broken. He says that, that, that even the, the word distinctions uh, will be kept, uh, that they will not pass away. They will stand as a testimony until his coming. Uh, the next passage I want to look at uh, is Psalm 119, uh, verse uh, uh, 89. Uh, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. The word of God is here said to forever exist and be established in the presence of God. This kind of language is used elsewhere in the Psalms to refer to God himself in Psalm 82, verse 1, God standeth in the congregation of the mighty, he judgeth among the gods. Of the natural order, in Psalm 74, verse 17, Thou hast set all the borders of the earth, thou hast made summer and winter, and also of his miraculous activity that he does toward the world. In Psalm 78, verse 13, He divided the sea, and caused them to pass through, and he made the waters to stand as an heap. In all of these cases, the word for stand or set uh, or, or to, to, to set up uh, is the same as which is used in Psalm 119.89. Thy word is settled in heaven. Forever it stands before the Lord. Uh, the Lord, when he speaks his word out, when he intends uh, by his uh, speaking, by his revealing himself, uh, that stands just as he stands in heaven, just as, as he stands in his kingly position in heaven, his uh, speech stands, his word stands, and also in the same way that he sets up a natural order in the world, uh, that, that it is established, it is done, and it cannot be thwarted by uh, anything, uh, anything humanly speaking, that it, it cannot be uh, overturned. Uh, one other example of this kind of language used of scripture is also found in Psalm 111, verses 7 and 8. The words of the works of his hands are verity and judgment. All his commandments are sure. They stand fast forever and ever, and are done in truth and uprightness. In Psalm 111, God's word is linked up with what God has said. God's work is linked up with what God has said. We are admonished in verse 2 and 4 to seek out and remember the works he has declared uh, he has declared because they stand forever and in verses 7 and 8 
we read not only his work stands forever, but also his judgments and his commandments, that is, his law, what he has told us, what he has revealed to us, that it stands forever. And so we are to seek it out, we're to remember it, because it is there for us to remember. It stands forever. In Deuteronomy 30, in verse 11, we have uh, another statement of preservation in Scripture, though uh, slightly less direct than the others. For this commandment, which I command thee this day, it is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that thou shouldest say, Who shall go up for us to heaven, and bring it unto us, that we may hear it and do it? Neither is it beyond the sea that thou shouldest say, Who shall go over the sea for us, and bring it unto us, that we may hear it and do it? But the word is very nigh thee, in thy mouth and in thy heart, that thou mayest do it. But the Lord uh, promises here, not only that his word would exist until the end, but also that it would be generally accessible to his people. They would never be able to say that the word of God was only in heaven or lost to them across the, the, the metaphorical sea here, the, the, the uh, expanses of, of places where they cannot go. Rather, it would be near to them and kept within their human capacity to go consult it. This leads us also to our next passages, and that is passages about the people of God and how he preserves his word for them. In Psalm 12, verse 5, For the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, now will I arise, saith the Lord. I will set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation for ever. Here, a re the reason given for why God's people can be sure God will set them at safety is because he preserves the promise that he spoke to them about setting them at safety. The uh, promise God gives, I will set him at safety from him that puffeth at him, is confirmed by the fact that God will not allow his promise to be forgotten. He will keep it. He will preserve it from not only this generation, but forever he will pre preserve his word. And so he will, he will keep the word that he spoke. He, he will fulfill his promises because he has uh, preserved his word. There are, of course, some uh, issues that are brought up in the interpretation uh, just given in this passage. Some will bring up the gender dissonance in this passage between the keeping of the Lord, thou shalt keep them, and the antecedent of that verb, that is, the words of the Lord, uh, that these two, uh, the, the gender of these two were, uh, uh, constructions do not match up. However, in a, a collection of essays edited by Kent Brendenburg, titled, Thou Shalt Keep Them, Thomas Strauss writes on page 32, The object of the first verb, shall keep them, must be closest, uh, must be the closest antecedent uh, word, uh, words. Although words is feminine plural, and the suffix on the verb is masculine singular, this gender dissonance is not unusual in other psalms dealing with God's word. He then gives, after this, an example, uh, several examples from Psalm 119 in verses 111, 129, and 152. And so the problem 
that, that we have between the, the mismatched genders, the, the gender dissonance in the language that's used in Psalm 12, is not a problem for the traditional interpretation of the passage to mean that God will preserve his word and thus he will keep his promise to his people to uh, keep them in safety. Uh, he also gives a, a footnote uh, there to uh, another scholar which uh, backs up his uh, opinion on this. But we'll just uh, move on for now. Uh, Matthew 4 verses 1 through 4 is the next passage I want to look at. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Here Jesus makes two affirmations that God preserves his word. First, he uses the perfect tense when he says, It is written. What this means is that God's word was not only written in the past, but was presently written when Jesus said these words. Christ cited the scripture as a present reality, having continuity with the original inspiration event, and not just as an abstract thing existing in the past. He saw the scripture as being accessible to him. What God had spoken, he could go and read. He also makes an affirmation that God preserved his word when he states that man relies on and must live according to every word of God. Not only is it that God's word was preserved in a general sense, but in a specific sense. Jesus says that every word of God is necessary in this passage. He was, at that time, in active obedience to every word that God had revealed to mankind, and he was calling all men to that same standard. This would be strange if Christ did not think he had every word of God. And so, of course, in citing the scripture, he cites a scripture that has to do with all the words of God, every word that was given. And so uh, he has an affirmation here, a dual affirmation of God's preserving his word. Uh, the next passage I want to look at is 1 Peter 1, 21 through 25. The scripture speaking of believers who by him, that is by Christ, do believe in God that raised up that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently being born again not of corruptible seed but of incorruptible by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever for all flesh is as grass and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. This is one of the more straightforward statements given of preservation. The word of the Lord is said directly to endure forever, and that this is the word which is preached in the gospel. This shows us how much the mission of the church relies on God preserving his word to every generation. And not only this, but it is the incorruptible word. The passage leaves no room open for error to sneak its way into the word of God and thwart his purposes in preserving it. God gave his word as a surety that the mission of the church would be completed. Notice the contrast in the passage between man and the glory of man, that man is as grass as the flower of the field, his glory fades away, but the word of God endures forever. 
it is here to make up for our lack. Uh, over the years, man falls. Man, uh, one generation passes away, another generation comes, and eventually they pass away. But the word of, the God, of God is the consistent factor in every generation of believers that come. God will preserve his word uncorruptible unto the end, so that the mission of the church will not fail at the passing of past generations. Now let's look at Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 19 together. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly uh, framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. It is generally accepted that the reference to the apostles and prophets is a reference to the ministry of writing the scriptures in this passage. The passage tells us that the scriptures are foundational to the church, implying that the church could not exist without the scripture to uphold it. It then tells us that the Spirit is working through history to build up the church into a fit temple for God to dwell in. This, of course, implies that the Spirit will not allow the foundation of the church to be taken away from the church. He must finish the work that he was sent to do, and so he preserves the scripture to that end. The church cannot exist without the word. The Spirit is building up the church for the purposes of glorifying God, and so the Spirit preserves the word of God throughout history. And so we have a, a statement of the preservation of Scripture that is uh, immediately verifiable by us. We see that the church exists. We see that uh, those who, who believe in Jesus Christ, who trust in him, are still doing faithful work in our day. And so the scripture must be around somewhere. It must be informing the church. It must be uh, uh, existing as the foundation of the church somewhere in order for the, the church to do its work. And so uh, here we have a, an implicit statement of the fact that God will preserve his word. Now, uh, related to the people of God and preservation, I want to look at some passages on uh, canonicity or canonization uh, as it relates to the preservation of the word of God. In John 17, verse 7 through 8, we read, Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee, for I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. And in verse 20, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Verses 7 and 8, Christ speaks of the words which he gave to his disciples, and how they received them. These words are then said to be handed over to the generation of believers who come to faith because of their ministry. The words of God are handed down from one generation to the next. The previous generation delivers up the scriptures, and the next generation receives them. This is plainly seen also in our next passage. In 2 Timothy uh, two or uh, three verses fourteen through seventeen, we read of Timothy. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof 
for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Here we simply see that Timothy had received the scripture from his mothers and mentors before him. They had raised him up in the teachings of God, in the scriptures. And that the scriptures we see are necessary in order to be equipped to every good work. This goes back again, uh, partly to, to what we saw before about the people of God, that God is building his church. He's building his people up. And if the scriptures are necessary for every good work, then God must preserve the scriptures in order for his people to be able to serve him. And so we also see, uh, again in 2 Timothy, some more statements of how the scripture is passed down from one generation to another. In 2 Timothy 1 verse 13, we read, Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. That thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost, which dwelleth in us. And in chapter 2, verse 2, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. In the first passage, Timothy is exhorted to hold firm to the words delivered to him from Paul, and to do so by the power of the Spirit. He's not doing this alone. He does it by the Spirit. But then he is told to commit the same to the next generation, which will also do the same. He is told to commit the scripture that was delivered to him to the next generation after him, and then they will commit the scripture to the next generation. The scripture is to be faithfully passed down from one generation to the next in unbroken succession. And again, we see that this is the work uh, of the Spirit, that, that, that He's the one that energizes this. He's the one that enables this. Uh, he's the one preserving His Word, uh, but He is preserving it through the community of believers. And this is how the canon of Scripture uh, is to be passed down. It's to be received from the previous generation and passed down to the next generation. Uh, it, it, it happens within the church, in uh, the, the context of the local church, in discipleship, in, in, in passing on the things that were delivered to us. And so with that, I want to look at two uh, final passages on the unbeliever and the preservation of Scripture. Uh, John 12, verse 48, Jesus says, he that rejecteth me, and receiveth not my words, hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Now these passages will be a little bit uh, emotionally difficult to work through, but we'll, uh, we'll try uh, the best that we can. Christ says that there is only one standard by which men will be judged at his coming. That is, the words that he had spoken. If anyone rejects these words, they will be destroyed. But this implies not only that Jesus spoke, but that his words are preserved as a testimony against his final judgment of the wicked. Uh, if the, the words that he had spoken will be the standard by which men will be judged, then he will preserve his word throughout human history uh, so that men uh, will be judged by it. By it. Uh, it'll be a testimony against them, constantly reminding them of the judgment to come. And this takes us to our last passage that we'll look at together here, uh, 2 Peter 3, verses 1 through 7. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, 
that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the word, the world, that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. This last passage is a long one, but we, I think we can see the, the, the simple thread that runs throughout the whole. In verse 2, we are exhorted to be mindful of the scripture, because in the last days evil men will continue to deny and speak out against the word of God. They will deny his promises to redeem his people and to punish them. But they are only self-deceived. They refuse to recognize the same word of God which created the world is the same word which we speak now and which is storing up the world unto judgment. His promises have not failed or passed away, but they are still here as a testimony against ungodly men. And so, of course, we're exhorted to remember the scripture. To remember what God has said and that he will keep his word. Now, of course, this would be hard to do if the word of God was not with us. If the word of God were not preserved by God. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the scripture uh, is, is the thing that the ungodly here are denying. Uh, but we, what we are told to to call to remembrance, to stir up in our pure minds. Uh, we're to be mindful of what God has spoken to the prophets, uh, in contrast to the way that the ungodly are suppressing his word, uh, that his word is there, that his word is upholding the world. Uh, because the Lord spoke these things, because the Lord said, let there be light, the, let the waters be divided, that therefore they uh, are established in that way. Uh, and so we have this uh, final statement here uh, that even though the ungodly deny this and they are willingly ignorant of it, they are suppressing the knowledge of God, just as we read in Romans chapter 1, uh, that nonetheless we can have confidence that the word of God is preserved. And so with that, uh, I'd just like to thank you for watching uh, this video. Uh, and uh, I would just like to, to exhort you to uh, do some more study on this. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, good content that's been put out on this uh, topic, on the topic of uh, the preservation of scripture, uh, and I would uh, just encourage you to uh, go and uh, look at that content. Uh, I'll just plug uh, a few channels that I like to go to, uh, Resisting the Downgrade on YouTube. Uh, it's run by uh, Brother Robert Trulove. Uh, also, the uh, gentleman at uh, Agros Church, uh, uh, Dane Johansson and Taylor DeSoto, they do a lot of uh, good work. Uh, and of course, uh, I would recommend that you uh, look at some uh, older content too. Look at uh, Robert Wyland's uh, old videos and uh, see what he has to uh, uh, say on this topic of preservation. Uh, but with that, again, I hope this video will be useful to someone. And so, uh, God bless.